So I'm the wrap-up speaker here, and I'm incredibly impressed that uh, this audience has uh, such persistence. You're probably staying for lunch rather than me, um, which means I have to be very uh, concise here. So uh, I have a poll, audience participation, to wake people up. So I'd like to, um, to see a show of hands here. Uh, who here is concerned about aging? Oh, I've just demonstrated a gradient uh, from the back to the front of the room. Okay. Um, who is scared of cancer? Okay. Uh, so people are very honest in this audience. That was a, a vast majority. And of course, everyone in this room is concerned about cardiovascular disease. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is try and tie these together in a way that was unsuspected just a few years ago. I'm going to talk about something called CHIP, which is a potent, a newly recognized, and common age-related risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So what is CHIP? It stands for clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. And to acquaint you with this, we have to take a little excursion into the world of leukemia research. So you all know about the Philadelphia chromos chromosome that uh, was discovered in the 1960s by Peter Noel and was really the first here uh, to be shown to have a genetic basis with a BCR ABL translocation that you all are familiar with. Uh, the oncology community has been uh, much quicker to adopt uh, genetics than those of us in <coughs> cardiovascular medicine. And you see through the years they have marched through uh, filling up the landscape of mutations that are associated with acute leukemia. On the upper panel is the alphabet soup of the driver mutations for acute leukemia. We have in cardiovascular disease our own alphabet soup, and the oncologists in revenge have one for us to become familiar with. And I'd like to call your attention to one particular one called TET2, uh, which is particularly age dependent, as you see by the height of the red bar there. And you've already uh, from uh, Dr. Feinberg's talk, learned about DMT3A. DMT3A. Uh, so these mutations are regulated or associated with age. Now, on the bottom, we have a chart here which looks at some of these driver mutations for acute leukemia, and each of the columns is a patient with acute leukemia. And you will note that in order to have acute leukemia, it looks like you need to have a number of different mutations. Uh, you need some of the common ones in red here, including TET2 and DMT3A, uh, but you also need to have other mutations as shown by the green. So three or four mutations to get acute leukemia. Now, my colleagues in the oncology field have been interested in turning back the clock to see if they could find pre-leukemic states where you have just one or two mutation. And so there are background mutations which happen in all of us, but mutations in these about 40 different driver genes for acute leukemia uh, accumulate with time. And I'll show you quantitative data about that in just a moment. And as you progress, you can accumulate, if you're unlucky, two driver mutations in which case you may get a myelodysplastic syndrome. Or if you get three or four, as I showed you on the previous slide, you can develop acute myelogenous leukemia. So I fell into bad company with the hematologist oncologists. They are subject to larceny, as uh, Milton Packer talked about with the endocrinologist yesterday. And my colleagues we're interested in what happens if you have just one of these driver mutations. Okay? And they call that clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. Now here are the characters with whom I fell in. Ben Ebert, a brilliant uh, young hematologist oncologist who's now the medical director of our cancer center, and his then postdoctoral fellow, Sid Jaswal. And they published a paper in the New England Journal in 2014 that showed that as we age, we accumulate mutations in these driver genes for acute leukemia. 
By the time that we're in the seventh decade, we have at least a 10% chance of having one of these mutations. And in fact, because the coverage of these particular mutations was not as good in uh, 2013, 2014, this is probably an underestimate, and I'll show you some more recent data in a moment. Now, if you have mutations, they tend to be clustered in just four. About 10% of those driver mutations account for a majority. Okay? And DMT3A, which you've already heard about, and TET2, are very prominent among them. If you have one of these driver gene mutations in a clone that's circulating in your peripheral blood, obviously your risk of having a hematologic malignancy is substantially increased, greater than tenfold. But here's the rub and how I got involved, is that it turns out that all-cause mortality is increased by 40%. The attack rate for acute leukemia, if you have one of, one of these driver mutations, is about 0.5 to 1% per year. So there's no way that you can account for a 40% increase in total mortality based on leukemia. Okay? Development of acute myelogenous leukemia cannot account for this 40% increase. So just to show you that it's not just in this initial study that we accumulate these mutations with time, uh, here in, in this paper done by uh, uh, some of the friends that we'll acquaint you with in a moment, uh, you see this is the original JSWAL study, and here are other studies that show the age-dependent accumulation of these mutations. So uh, we published some evidence in 2017 that cardiovascular disease makes up this gap, this increase in total mortality which cannot be explained. And this undertaking was a broad collaboration, and I'll introduce you to the collaborators. Uh, so what was done was to take whole exome sequencing uh, to detect the presence of these driver mutations. By the way, the reason it's called indeterminate potential is because most people who have this will never know it. So it's sort of like MGUS, you know, the, the uh, monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance is exactly analogous, formally similar. Um, so what we did was to look for coronary heart disease signals in these four large populations. I think most of the people in the room are familiar with these. This is uh, the bioimage uh, that Valentin Fuster put together and his champion. This is the uh, very long-term uh, myeloma diet and cancer study. These are particularly interesting uh, cohorts of people with premature myocardial infarction. Um, so the hero of this part of the story is uh, Pradeep Natarajan, now runs preventive cardiology at the Mass General, and uh, Sik Katharason is probably known to all the cardiovascular investigators here. And fully adjusted for all of our traditional risk factors, if you have one of these mutations, in a clone swimming through your bloodstream, you have a 1.9-fold increase in your risk of coronary heart disease. Let's put that in perspective. If we look at the effect on coronary heart disease of a one standard deviation increase in traditional risk factors, such as total cholesterol, or systolic blood pressure, non-HDL cholesterol that we heard about from Aaron Bahula yesterday, or the marker of inflammation, C-reactive protein, we get at best a 1.4% enrichment in risk for a one standard deviation increase. Well, here's where we are with CHIP. So this is fully adjusted and incredibly potent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. If you are young, that is under 50, and you have acute myocardial infarction, uh, it turns out that the risk that is attributable to those driver mutations to having CHIP is almost fourfold. There's some very interesting wrinkles here which I won't have time to go into. So you're told not to mix metaphors. But, you know, at my stage, I can do whatever I want. So this is obviously meant to depict a blood vessel with a little lining of endothelial cells. But it also is a road, a pathway. So my mixed metaphor is telling you that we have mutational events in stem cells in the bone marrow that can give rise to these clones because of a selective or proliferative advantage or survival advantage, and that 
the pathway to leukemia is paved with cardiovascular disease, acute myocardial infarction and stroke, uh, perhaps with some of these mutations, thromboembolic disease, and then ultimately acute leukemia if you're unlucky enough to get several hits in one clone. Well, you're a very sophisticated audience, and so at this point you're saying, Peter, you showed us that these mutations accumulate with age, and age, I know, is a prime driver of atherosclerotic risk. And how do we know that it's true, true, and related, or true, true, and unrelated? And so that's why I came into the picture here, because we worked with uh, Sid Jaiswal and Ben Ebert to test causality in mouse with, uh, mice with experimental atherosclerosis. So we first constructed mice that had a loss of function of one of these prominent driver genes, uh, TET2, uh, under the control of a uh, promoter that caused its deficiency uh, in hematologic lineage. And th these were bone marrow chimera cells, so it was bone we reconstituted the bone marrow in animals that had, had ablation of their bone marrow. And we fed the animals the usual hypercholesterolemic diet. And lo and behold, we found that the mice that had the loss of function in the chip driver gene had acceleration in atherosclerosis. As you can see here in the aortic root, by an all-foss analysis looking at the lipid staining as we do in these kinds of experiments, you see that whether you were a heterozygote or you had a full deficiency of this driver gene for chip, there was an increase in atherosclerosis. Now, remarkably, there was no change in our usual risk factors. The uh, lipid panel was completely normal. To have CHIP, the definition of CHIP excludes people with leukemia. Okay? And indeed, our animals, the hemogram, looked perfectly the same as controls. Now, in order to cone down on the myeloid lineage, we used a different promoter in a separate series of independent experiments. We used a promoter which uh, looped out the TET2 gene only in monocytes and neutrophils, the myeloid lineage. And as you see, we had an increase, a handsome increase in atherosclerosis. Now, one can do some pretty cool things once you've constructed these mice. You can take bone marrow-derived macrophages, which you mature in vitro with standard preparation that we do all the time, and you can incubate them with a classical risk factor, um, low-density lipoprotein, which probably is a little bit modified by the time you do the experiments. And then you can do RNA sequence analysis and see what genes are turned on differentially in the animals that have the chip <coughs> mutation. And lo and behold, some of the big hits in the RNA-seq were some of my old friends. Interleukin-1-beta, which was the subject of a clinical trial, which you have heard about in the past, uh, which we believe contributes to human atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic events, and downstream of interleukin-1-beta, interleukin-6. At the same time, Ken Walsh's lab, a few miles away, uh, did a very similar experiment based on the 2014 paper uh, from Ben and, and Sid and came up with very similar results. Okay. Now, I showed you RNA in isolated cells, but what about the mouse? Okay, what about what's happening in vivo? And what about what's happening in peripheral blood to proteins that are related to inflammation? When one looks in the peripheral blood of these mutant mice, one finds an increase in a family of chemokines that are chemoattractants, that you see here. So uh, this is an old, old slide of mine that Sid Jaiswal modified uh, to give you some insight into how we think this is working. Uh, these chemoattractant cytokines and the receptors that we saw were increased in the animals that had the chip mutation they were probably having an increase in recruitment and retention of the mononuclear phagocytes that we believe are important. So that's, that's very nice, but what's the mechanism by which the chemokines are turned on? 
and the cytokines such as IL-1 and IL-6. Well, here's where I'm so glad uh, that uh, Andy Feinberg gave his talk, uh, because he talked to you about epigenetic control and about how methylation of cytosine by this DNA methyltransferase is very important. And there's actually a pathway here. He had buried on one of his slides TET2, which is the mutation that we studied in the mice. And TET2 actually is a demethylase, uh, which can lead to a hydroxyl function here, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. Uh, okay. And it turns out that uh, this may be a transcriptional mediator, as well as, of course, this pathway leads to the methylation, which Andy Feinberg showed us is so important <coughs> in genetic regulation. So um, you heard that wonderful talk from someone with a cancer perspective. If you're interested in reading about epigenetics from a cardiovascular perspective, I would direct you to this fairly recent review where uh, we talked about epigenetics. And of course, methylation of DNA and histones are critical in epigenetic control. So uh, here's what we think the molecular mechanisms may turn out to be to explain this newfound cardiovascular risk factor. You have these clones in peripheral blood, and two of the most prominent mutations are going to lead to epigenetic alteration that we believe controls the expression of a cassette of pro-inflammatory genes that can drive the inflammatory process that is underway in the intima of the atherosclerotic plaque. Um, I don't have time to go into this other family of mutations or this other mutation, but uh, the Janus kinase mutations are probably completely different, and we believe that they may work by increasing a neutrophil extracellular trap, so you have to invite me back sometime to hear about NETs. So uh, bottom line here is that clonal hematopoiesis increases with age, and those with clonal hematopoiesis have a much greater risk of cardiovascular events than of developing hematologic malignancy. Uh, the cardiovascular risk that's associated with CHIP is independent of traditional risk factors and is probably at least as potent as traditional risk factors, except for age, of course. And the mouse studies that we were able to help with support the causal role of these mutations in heightened atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, the embargo on our New England Journal paper was lifted at 5.30 on a Wednesday in the middle of June of 2017. And I was at the Gordon Conference on Atherosclerosis. And I was supposed to speak about Cantos in the evening session. But I was unblinded to Cantos. And I wasn't going to get up in front of the audience and be coy and say, uh, this is embargo and I can't show you the data. So I asked the chairperson, who happened to be my, my mentee, I said, can I change my title? I'd like to talk about something new. So uh, a few hours after the embargo was lifted, I walked into the room after dinner at the Gordon Conference to give my talk, similar to the one that you just heard. And sitting across the aisle from me was Andreas Steyer uh, from Frankfurt. And Andreas had his laptop over. He said, Peter, I'm just looking at your paper. This is terrific. So you know, we had dinner together the next night, and one thing led to another. And Andreas, as you know, if you're in the cardiovascular community, had done some studies where he isolated bone marrow cells from a series of patients with ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and squirted those cells back into the coronary arteries and hoped that something good would happen. Well, nothing much good happened from that, but something very good happened from the undertaking. And that is that he had banked some of the bone marrow from those patients. These are patients at high risk of heart failure because they would survive to STEMI. And so Andreas went back with Stefanie Dimmler and did sequencing, very deep sequencing, uh, for the chip genes in that population, a small population, about 200 people who had participated in their stem cell regenerative medicine attempts. Okay, with age, there was an increase in chip in their hands. So this is a completely different cohort, completely different country. Same phenomenon, and now in this particularly, this was by definition an atherosclerotic population, you see that it was almost a quarter of pe people in uh, the eighth decade were porters, were, were carriers of chip. 
Uh, and if we look at the mutations that were in this population, they're the same usual cast of characters that top four or five are about the same as in the original publications. And this is concordant with a lot of other data that are coming out now. But the remarkable thing is that Andreas and Stephanie and their team found that CHIP not only related to myocardial infarction and stroke, but also to heart failure outcomes, things that we really care about in clinical cardiology. Uh, overall survival uh, depended on your CHIP status with DMT3A and TET2 being the top two. And uh, your event-free survival, including heart failure hospitalizations, uh, also were dependent on your CHIP status. And their sequencing was focused on this region of the genome, uh, these particular parts of the exomes. And they ratcheted down the variant allele fraction from the definition of CHIP, which is 2%, um, to 1%, and still found a significant relationship with heart failure. Um, so bottom line is that CHIP not only drives atherothrombosis, but also appears to be associated with heart failure. So there in the realm of cardiovascular medicine are two of our most important unsolved problems, and they relate to CHIP. A couple of uh, little tidbits, because the field is marching forward. Um, one of the questions that we often get is, well, you know, you targeted inflammation, IL-1 beta, in the Cantos trial. Uh, does CHIP status make any difference? Now, unfortunately, we, we had genetic consent on a minority of participants, and there are little power problems, which is why this hasn't been published yet. It's still um, in the incubator. But indeed, the trends are all supportive of the idea that people who have CHIP mutations, particularly DMT3A and TET2 mutations, are able to derive a greater benefit from targeting IL-1 beta. Now, DMT3A is where we started uh, with uh, Andy Feinberg yesterday and uh, Phil Rausch and uh, Sid Jaswal, who's now established his own lab at Stanford, uh, have followed up the TET2 studies with DMT3A. And the cool thing is that it's convergent in terms of the biology. It looks like IL-6 and IL-1 are also increased there. So I promised you a few minutes ago that I would tie together aging, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. And the link is clonal hematopoiesis. So I'd like to, to thank all of these uh, collaborators. And